we still got one song.
have the mic on? That was bound to happen. Art showed me how to do it, and I still messed it up. All right. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Steve Clark, and I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Uh, I see there's a, a few new people out here. So if you're wondering, uh, what does this word SASIF mean, and where does it come from? It's an acronym from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And it stands for seek and ye shall find. Um, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to he that knocketh it shall be opened. So now you see we're not a cult. We're not any strange people. Uh, just got a strange name. All right. In a few minutes we will have an open mic time. For you to share how God has been working in your life. So if the Spirit is leading you, please come on up to the front and use the mic. Um, and talk, please. And please use the mic because we're live streamed. We want everybody to hear it, including the people out on the, on the net. So uh, don't be bashful because it's a blessing to all of us and an encouragement to all of us to see how the Lord is working in your life. Uh, beginning today, we will be suspending children's Sunday school until further notice. There is still child care for children five and under. Children six and over will remain with their parents during the service. If your child becomes fussy or wiggly, feel free to move to the back of the room. There's some chairs back there. Uh, and if you want, there's also a, uh, the toddler room uh, through the double doors to the right opposite the uh, nursery, and there's some toys there that they can play with. Um, today is the first Sunday of the month, and that means it's Potluck Sunday, and we'll be having that right after service. Uh, we want everybody to stay and have lunch with us, even if you didn't bring anything. We have plenty, and we, uh, it's a good time to fellowship. Our elders have planned an informal congregation discussion meeting uh, in two weeks, Sunday, August 20th at 5 p.m. in this room. Uh, everyone's encouraged to attend. The elders will be sending out discussion points soon. Volleyball for that evening will be pushed back to 7 p.m. This helps. Um, Scott Clark is heading off to the Army today. Right after, right after potluck, he's headed, uh, headed up to Baltimore to go in the Army. And we want to send him off with uh, prayer. Uh, so we're asking uh, Pastor Tom to uh, come forward. Thanks, Steve. So uh, I'm going to ask Scott to come up here. And if, if you've been involved as a, as a parent or youth worker or a fellow elder in Scotty's life, you can... Come up and join me here as well. Scotty, uh, tell everybody, what place are you going to for boot camp, and what, do you, what field do you might get into in the Army? Do you know? Um, I'm going to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for boot camp, and then for my MOS, it's 15 Romeo, which is Apache Helicopter Mechanic. Apache Helicopter Mechanic, all right. So, Army's, Army's got soldiers, right? Let me just read a couple of verses in the Bible about soldiers. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
a few scattered verses in there. You, therefore, my son, although Timothy is probably 35 when he's writing this to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So we ask, Scotty, that as you go in the army, that you do be strong in the grace that's there. Um, that you're, you know, you're, you're going to go through some suffering in boot camp, probably. Um, but you may also find some suffering in some spiritual areas in life. And uh, so uh, you might be suffering for doing the thing that God says is right and everybody else thinks is wrong. And we ask you to, uh, we hope that you're, you're going to focus, you know, the, the Bible scriptures said focus on not getting entangled in civilian affairs. And that's what a soldier needs to do. Focus on your career. Um, but you also need to focus on what God's plans are for you and not get entangled with, there's going to be a lot of other stuff out there in the, in the Carolinas. And so that's why Timothy ended up with, listen to what I say. And the Lord will give you understanding in these things. So we pray the Lord gives you understanding to be able to do those things that a soldier is going to do. You're going to represent your country. You're going to represent St. Mary's County. You're going to represent your family name. Um, and so let's pray for you as you go and do those things. Father, we ask that you give Scott your, your grace to follow you, to not entangle himself in those things that are outside of his profession or outside of his following with you that you uh, allow him to listen to the words that have been put into his life over many, many years by many people here, that he will gain great understanding. Give him great understanding of what you have for him and how to follow you more closely, that he will please not only his commanding officer in the army, but he will please you, our commanding officer, and receive that good and faithful well done. Thank you for the investment that people have made in Scotty's life. Make him a great soldier for yourself in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you hear me? How about now? Yes. All right. Who would like to be first? I will start us off then. Um, a couple weeks ago, my son Josiah went into the Army, as most of you know. And now Scotty's going in. Uh, we didn't have an open mic two weeks ago, but I, I'd just like to say for, for both of them, it's, uh, I know what they're about to go through. I know... It's going to be a challenge, but I also know that you're ready. And it's, it's bittersweet because both Josiah and Scotty have been a, a help to me. And uh, in, in a sense, I, I don't want to see them go, but I, I also know they need to go. And, and they're, they're men now, and it's, it's time to be a man. And, and uh, I just pray that you don't. Don't forget the Lord, and it, it's all in His hands, and you gotta, you have to call on His name and depend on Him every day. Good morning, church family. I just want to say I talked to Scotty a week or so, about last week. He's going to do fine because he is knows how to deal with people, knows how to talk to people. And I want to tell you that I won't tell you where I heard this, but Jesus is already there where you're going. So you're going to do great, and Jesus has already got you. So, and Lord, I just I want to just tell everybody, I tell people this all the time that I talk to about the Lord. If he blessed me anymore, he could just take me home right now. 
because he is just good. He is just good. So just keep him in your mind and talk to, talk to him, pray, and you're going to do well. Thank you, guys. I know something's been happening. Yes, sir. My name is Glenn Hammond. I live in Manassas, Virginia. I'm visiting here because uh, Brother Johnny Cusick, oh, I'm sorry, John Cusick, I met him. His, he was Johnny Cusick. And I met him, it was March the 10th, 1972. It was a Friday night, and he was invited to our house. I didn't know him uh, because the family that I was renting the top of the house out knew him, and they wanted to celebrate their new home. And none of us knew that John had just gotten saved, and he shared his testimony. Actually, when he came, I got bored. I was 21 years old. I was lost. I didn't know God. I was separated from Christ. No hope in the world. So I went down the basement where I lived and began working on my project. Today I call it Vanity of Vanities. It was candle making. Nothing wrong with it. It wasn't sinful, but it was vanity because it occupied my heart, whereas God should have been occupying my heart. But for 21 years, I was ignorant and lost and in darkness. And I heard John say two words from downstairs. One was Jesus. The other was the devil. And it attracted me, and I went upstairs to hear what was going on, and he shared his testimony. That night, I was attracted, and I said, I've got to find out what's going on. I, I knew I was in the hippie movement. That was supposed to be the greatest thing going on, and it was the greatest deception. And I knew it was a dead end, and I was ready to fall off the cliff, and I did not want my life to end in that kind of miserable condition. So I listened, and I was attracted. And I went with him Sunday morning, March the 12th, and the Holy Spirit convicted me of sin. I wept like a little baby. I knew that I had wasted 21 years of my life without God, and I knew I needed God in my life. And it was through Jesus Christ who died for us and loved us. And I was, I was saved. I was born again. My life changed. But before I went up to the invitation to get saved, I had a struggle. During the message, I was ready. But when the invitation came, I began to struggle. The struggle was within my soul. And the first question I had was, I don't know that the Bible is true. Now, I'm ignorant. I didn't even have a Bible. I'd never read the Bible. So I said, well, I need to get a Bible. I need to read the whole thing and discern whether this is true or not because I can't give myself to this. And God spoke to me, go up there and read the Bible. After. So I got a Bible. And when I began to read the Bible, I knew when I got to chapter 5 of Matthew, starting with verse, chapter 1, this is God's word. I, I was sold out. I knew this is the word of God, and I gave myself to it. And this is what I want to say, a short testimony, an exhortation to the Word of God. This is the greatest thing in my life that has kept me all these 51 years walking with God is His Word. His Word is a lamp unto our feet, you know, a light unto our path. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 says that man shall live on every word that proceeds out through the mouth of God. And Timothy says that all scripture is given by inspiration. The literal translation is God breathed. So I learned in my Christian life, when I come to the word, I breathe it in. The words Jesus spoke are spirit and life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And every day, every morning, I wake up with a great anticipation that I am going to meet God in the Word of God. 
And I get a living message from God every day. Sometimes I don't want to leave. I just want to stay in my little office. It's like the holy of holies to me. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is my testimony. And I realize by my reading of the scriptures and letting the word of Christ dwell in me richly that I meet a lot of Christians, a lot of professing Christians that don't read their Bible. They have not tasted that the Lord is good. Somehow they missed it. I don't know how. They got caught up in all kinds of things and compromise and worldliness and sinfulness in their life where I read the word of God. I am free from sin. I am free from the world. I am free from myself. This is my testimony. And this is my exhortation to you, even though I don't know you. If you don't let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, you're in trouble. If you don't read the word of God daily, you're in trouble. But I found out in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, you need a little strength. You need a little power to read God's word. It says to the church in Philadelphia, you have a little strength and have not, uh, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You need a little strength to read the Bible because everything is against it. And also, my reading of the scripture is by means of all prayer in Ephesians 6, 18. I learned these things and they are the greatest blessing because they bring us into a constant fellowship with God, a walking with God. And by that, we are saved from this world. We're saved from ourself. It is wonderful. So I could go on and on and on, but I, I promise to go down. While Jeff is walking up here, I just want to say uh, that's a, a great encouragement, uh, Glenn, and that's, that's from somebody who didn't know the Lord until somebody in this con sitting in this congregation right here gave him the word of the Lord. And there you have re reproduction, multiplication. Thank you for that testimony. And thank you, John. Praise the Lord. My name is Jeff, and my daughter Lizzie just started the um, cleaning the building that you guys had met, um, seen up there. They were looking for applicants. And something happened to her, which is right in line with the sermons of Nehemiah and rebuilding the wall, is she showed up to the church to do some work and found the Clark family working. And they had done half of the job that she was going to do. And I was, and she told me, and I was like, that's happened to me so many times because I'm a trustee. God has a sense of humor, and as a trustee, one of my responsibilities is to help keep the grounds in the building. And I'm not mechanically inclined, so, so many times I was like, I don't know how this is going to get done, Lord. And I show up, and there's the Clarks. So we're praising the Lord for the Clark family today. So I thought it was very uh, time um, appropriate that the Lord is providing workers the hands, uh, many hands make the word, the work light, and um, you're going to be sorely missed. God's got plans for you. It's awesome. Um, but I want to thank all of you who are coming together and, and um, serving the Lord in the church body, and thank you, brother, for your testimony. Hello. Um, last week, I um, received membership to this congregation, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's um, guided me, obviously my parents, but there's been so many people who have just been there for me and come up and shared with me and encouraged me, and I just wanted to thank all of you. <laughs> uh, don't quite know what I'm going to say. I just feel I need to say something. I just ask the Lord to lead me in what I may say. That joy I had in my heart that Glenn seen 
like say, we've been saved for 50 some years. I'm not as fluent in reading the Bible as a lot of other people are in maintaining or attaining what it says. My prayer this morning before I left is, Lord, open my mind. I don't believe it's because of my age that I'm not remembering. I think there's a blockage somewhere. And I want this to be opened. And I'm letting the congregation know that we stand together for people like me and like you, that we stand for one another, that this can be done because there's nothing God can't do. And there's nothing God can't do where there's a place that God is speaking. Unfortunately, God is not speaking everywhere anymore. I hate to say that, but he's not. I've roamed around a lot. I came here probably three months ago. Maybe, I don't know how long it was. Three months ago, I guess. I wasn't going to come back. But I came back because of you people out here, my brothers and sisters. The fellowship that I got behind those curtains was encouraging to me. And this is what brought me back. I tasted something, like Glenn tasted when I spoke that night 50 some years ago. I tasted something in what you folks were saying to me. So it brought me back. I've been sharing with Brother Glenn. We talk on the phone a couple times a week and we have good fellowship together. We were apart for 40 some years and we finally connected again. And it's been just joyous that, that you have a brother that you can go to and talk to. And I was telling Glenn, I said, Glenn, I'd really like for you to come to where I go meet. Now I know he lives two and a half hours away. He didn't come specifically to come here today, I don't think, because he had fellowship yesterday. But I think the real reason Glenn made the trip was to be here today and share his word that he shared. This is God's way of working. He works through us. And if you're sitting out there and you don't feel God is using you, please, please look harder inside. Because behind that curtain, what you folks were sharing with me is what brought me back. You may not have realized it, but that's what brought me back. I'm explaining to Glenn, I've never been in a place like this. I don't mean to be harsh, but where I've seen something tear down. But now there's a place of rebuilding. And so I've been sharing, Glenn, God is doing something in this congregation as small as it is. I can see it. I can taste it. God is building, as we say in Nehemiah, the walls for a fellowship. God is always looking for a place to speak. And like I said, he's not speaking out there in the world. And I hate to say it, he's not speaking in every church I've been to either. I hate to say that. And God forgive me if I'm wrong in judging anyone. But you can sense in your spirit that God is speaking. And this is what we're longing for for God to touch that spirit that he touched in me 50 some years ago. The only true thing for 50 some years that I have to stand on, and I know without a shadow of a doubt, is the only true thing, it's when I spoke the words, Lord forgive me, 50 some years ago. When I go through my trials and tribulations, I'm brought back to that point that God witnessed to me. He gave me something that the world can't take away. It's embedded in me. It's now coming out through the congregation and fellowship that I have here. It's coming out of me. God just wants to speak through his children. This is how he speaks on earth today. He speaks to us, yes, but he speaks through us. And we're to shed this to other people. We're to share this. This is our light. This is our joy. And this is what Christ has given us. Come to me, all you all that are heavily laden. I don't know the verse, but I bet you Brother Glenn can tell me what verse it is, because I know he knows it. But again, this is what God is doing. And I just am so proud and so happy to be a part of what's going on in this congregation. My prayer is for this place to continue to go in, to see people coming, to see people seeking the Lord, because there's nothing out there. Like I said, it's vanity. It's not real. What we have and what I see in your smiling faces is real. This is Christ. And this is what we were meant to do 
earthen vessels to maintain Christ. Thank you. All right, moving, moving on to giving. If you are led to give, if the Lord is leading you to give back some to what he is, everything he's given, everything we have is, is from the Lord. And he works through us. He works through people. Um, if you're led to give, there's two ways that you can do it. We have a box as you head out the door there at the double doors on the right-hand side attached to the wall there, you can give that way. Or you can give online uh, on our website at stasis.org. Uh, moving to communion. Uh, the book of John starts out telling us that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him and apart from Him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. Then verse 14 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So verse 14 identifies this person called the Word as Jesus. And as I was trying to wrap my mind around why John is referring to the pre-incarnate Christ as the Word. Um, I could find multiple reasons looking through Scripture, uh, applications, why Jesus is, re is referred to as the Word, but I can't grasp it in its entirety. I can't get a... The, the more I dig, the more complex it becomes. And I, I can't really explain it. it. It's sort of like the Trinity, I think. Um, but so it is if the word of God and Jesus are one and the same. In its simplest form, it's exactly how the scriptures say. In the beginning, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, it says, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. So just as Jesus is the exact representation of the invisible father, he is also the exact representation of the word in action. The book of Colossians in chapter 1 verses 21 through 22 says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So how does Jesus present us, the church, the bride of Christ, holy and blameless to himself? Well, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 tells us that. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless dear heavenly father we thank you for this day, this day that you've given us, this place to worship you, to pro the provisions which you've given us, the many blessings that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that we've heard this morning from the personal testimonies. And Lord, as we partake of this bread and cup, let us remember your loving sacrifice. And let's also celebrate 
the work that you are doing in each and every one of us through the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
be seated. Is. Thank you. How about that? So there you go, Steve. You don't have to feel bad. So let's try this again. How about that? All right, let's see. So, one more time. I hope you're not missing what the Holy Spirit is up to this morning. Um, I stand before you bursting with joy at what's happening and, frankly, completely terrified uh, that uh, somehow I'm going to dilute or distract from what the Lord's already been up to today. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimonies. Thank you, all of you, for your testimonies today. I, um, I don't know that I'll have anything to add, but I ask your patience. Um, maybe the Lord will make use of this, but it won't unless we pray. So would you pray with me while we get started? Father, I rejoice at uh, the clear evidence that your Holy Spirit is work here this morning. It's in work in all of us. It's in work in me. And frankly, God, as I've confessed to these people, I confess to you, I'm terrified I'm going to get in the way of what you're doing or distract the people here somehow. So, God, I pray that you would work in me, that you would uh, use this imperfect person and my imperfect preparation to work perfect results through your spirit here today, that you would be glorified and we'd be edified. In Jesus' name, for his glory, amen. Oh, I'm going to have to get my composure. It's been a powerful morning already. Um, it's really good to see all of you. It's good to see some of you back. It's very encouraging. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you again here. Today is the first in 20-plus equipping sessions that I hope to do with you uh, that we do together based in Psalm 119. What we are not going to do this morning, not going to do this morning, is we are not going to look much at the text of Psalm 119 itself. We're going to talk about it. We're going to look into the text deeply next week, God willing. But we are going to do a number of varied and interesting things, maybe interesting, to introduce and paint the background uh, scene so that we're ready to move forward in the text and dive into the text next Sunday, should the Lord tarry. So some of the things that we're going to do that I'm going to endeavor to do this morning um, are that we understand, all of us together, that we understand how Psalm 119 complements our Nehemiah series, which I think others have done an excellent job this morning of making that point. I'm going to try and explain my strange use of God's headlamp imagery. We're going to embrace our love-hate relationship with the Psalms. We're going to examine the interpretive background for Psalm 119. Uh, we're going to see the utility of acrostics and poetry as memory aids. And we're going to understand and then commit to our homework that we're going to do for this series. Hope you're ready. I've entitled this series, Ode 
to God's Headlamp, which I admit is a little bit of an unusual title. If you, if you, if you look in the dictionary and not a mathematical one, uh, ode is defined as a lyrical poem in the form of an address to a particular subject, often elevated in style or manner, and written in varied or irregular meter. Psalm 119 certainly fits that definition. In this case, the particular subject, as has been hammered a number of times this morning, is the Word of God, God's Word. Specifically, Psalm 119 is the writer's testimony of the blessings and the benefits of a life lived in light of God's Word. And I'm calling God's Word, God's headlamp, for reasons I'll explain in a little bit. I'm really excited about this sermon series for a couple reasons. I've been walking behind Jesus now for about 23 years. And in my 23 years of following Jesus around, I have never participated in a sermon series or a teaching time in Psalms. I've had snippets of Psalms. Occasionally one Psalm would come out. Um, but really never like marched through Psalms in any appreciative way. I think the reasons for that, we'll talk about that. As I've already mentioned, I believe this particular psalm super nicely complements what we're doing and what the God's doing through a Nehemiah series that's ongoing. But most importantly, I believe that this particular psalm, based on the cloud of witnesses Tom mentioned last week, who testify to its power, that this psalm in particular can radically, radically energize our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So, sounds ambitious. I hope you're willing. Um, I'm going to work up a good appetite for you today, right? And so please stick around um, and enjoy. Now let's see if I've managed, if the uh, technology will support this. Hooray. I hope that picture looks familiar to you because for the last several Sundays, we have been studying through the book of Nehemiah, thanks to Tom and recently Sean for leading us through that. Tom, when he was developing this series, aptly named it Rebuilding What is Broken. He chose that name. I was there. I was a witness to him changing it. Just recently, one of our dear sisters here asked me a very pointed question. What is broken that we're trying to rebuild? I think that's a pretty excellent question. We clearly don't have literally physically broken down walls or gates or any such thing here. So what, what is it we're rebuilding? I think there are two really important things. The first one is our trust. Our trust for one another, but more importantly, our trust in God's love and provision for his church. Related, but different, and number two thing I think is broken that we're in the process of rebuilding is our hope. When we mistrust each other, and when we doubt God's love for us, we lose hope. Several of our friends over the last couple years have lost their hope. The book of Nehemiah and its precursor, Ezra, are super encouraging because they record God doing amazingly great things through a little tiny remnant, a handful of people of the millions of exiled Jews that were living in Mesopotamia and Persia at the time of their writing. By God's Spirit, he takes that itsy-bitsy, teeny little group of people, this little tiny remnant, and he leads them back to Jerusalem, where they rebuild the temple, and they rebuild the walls, and they rebuild the gates. Both books record God, in, the process, in, the, in that mighty work, God's specially raising up a couple key leaders to help guide his people and to accomplish the work. Zerubbabel, name we all like to call different things, Ebel, 
Jeshua, the priest, Ezra, the scribe, and Nehemiah, the governor. Those are the big characters that scriptures record for us God used, whose spirit, he used his spirit to stir them specially to help guide and accomplish this great work. But just as the remnant rebuilt the temples and the walls on the physical foundations that were left, when they did the destroying, when Nebuchadnezzar and the armies came through, they, they didn't destroy it and excavate the foundations. The foundations were still there. They had something left to build on. And it's these leaders that God used through his spirit to rebuild the broken hearts of the people using the spiritual foundation of the Word of God. We didn't cover the book of Ezra, but it's a complimentary book. For, for thousands of years, they were took, taught together. Ezra, the book of Ezra, and chronologically and in your Bible, precedes Nehemiah, and it documents the rebuilding of the temple and the reinstatement of Mosaic worship practices and Levitical practices. I excerpted verses 1 and 2, part of them out of Ezra 3, which read like this. The people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of, God, altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as is written in the law of Moses the man of God. So my question is this. How did Jeshua and Zerubbabel know what was written in the law of Moses? They got ripped out of their temple in their home and all their life destroyed. They were refugees. They were captives. And they got snatched into a land full of all kinds of evil, strange religious practices. And yet, some of their fellow exiles so understood the significance of God's word, so esteemed the significance of God's word that they preserved it and taught it and passed it down. And then God used those people in that foundation to stir up with his spirit and return them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and ultimately the walls and the gates. The main story of the book of Ezra, the main story, even though it talks all about the temple and everything else, is that God used Jeshua and Zerubbabel and Ezra to return the people of God to standing on and keeping his word. That's the message of the book of Ezra. And we're going to see why God used Ezra. Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. Ezra, this is after the actual physical temple is rebuilt. Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. Skipping down to verse 10. This is important. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Yeah, God used Jeshua, Zerubbabel. They built up a bunch of stuff. They reinstated some practices, but God used Ezra, Ezra who had set his heart on the law of the Lord, God used him to bring revival to his people in that place. Now we finally get to where we've been in Nehemiah. Let's look again at a portion of the great prayer of Nehemiah that, that Tom so effectively pointed out to us when he covered it several weeks ago. Nehemiah uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. This is Nehemiah praying to God on behalf of the people. And he says, We have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept the commandments and the statutes 
and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that, your com- that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. Again, I have this same rhetorical question. How did Nehemiah know what God's commandments and statutes and rules that he commanded through his servant Moses? How did he even have an idea? Just like the others, he had been steeped in the word of God while he was in exile. So let's just ponder for one second the whole exilic, that's a fancy Bible college word for the period of time of exile. Let's consider the exilic timeline for just a second to see a little bit more of the supernatural that's involved here. Prophecy, the general idea that we've heard and we can find many places that, you know, we're going to exile you for 70 years, and after 70 years, we're going to bring the people back. If you look online and look at most of the Bible timelines that people have put, labored to put together and people put a lot of work into it, it shows at least 50 years elapsed from the time of the fall of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar when he invaded, when the, when the exile began, until the first return, or sorry, the return of the first exiles in Ezra chapter 2. If you look at the timelines, people have put piece together, and I didn't do a deep dive in that, and one of you can do, God bless you, you can get a PhD at Bible college by doing that. But assuming that Jeshua and Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah were exiled, they were in Jerusalem before, they had firsthand knowledge of what things were before they were exiled. The oldest they probably could have been and still been used in the way that we see in Ezra and Nehemiah is that would have made them like 20 years old at the oldest. 20 years old when they got ripped out of Jerusalem and sent up to Babylon and all those places. 20 years old. And that's what God did with them after 50 years of immersing him in his word. So I hope I've helped you see and I hope you believe that Psalm 119 is a really super complimentary text to what we've been studying in Nehemiah because they both testify to the significance and the power and the essentialness of the Word of God. That's why they go together. Okay, now it's time for some class participation. We're going to do a lot of class participation in the next 22 sessions together, so get used to it. You've got to come here in athletic attire. You've got to come here ready to participate. So I look out here, and there are only a few faces I don't know well, but I know a lot of you really well. I know where you've been, and I know what you know. I also know that all of you have Bible apps, and you have maybe paper Bibles with concordances, and you're welcome to use them. But I just want people to call out, just call out any New Testament passage, we heard one or two already today at testimony time, that exalt the Word of God and speak of its benefits from the New Testament. Go ahead. You don't have to raise your hand. You can just call it out. We heard one already. We've heard two, actually. Sing it out loud. Can you say it for us? 2 Timothy 3.16. Awesome. Okay, that was the one that you should all absolutely know. What are some others maybe a little bit more esoteric? I think I, there's one that everybody knows. We heard it today from Hebrews. Yes, sir? Go ahead. Amen. All right, we got two. I know, I know you guys have got lots of things. You can use your app. It's okay if you don't remember off the top of your head, right? I'm not giving you a, you're not going to the, getting a wanna bucks for what you do this morning, right? You're getting kingdom bucks, right? So if you need to use your tools, God gave you those tools. So use your concordance. 
Use your search function. Maybe remember some of the things that you taught or learned in Awana. I know you guys know a lot of verses. The New Testament talks about the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active. Amen. Hebrews. Amen. That was one I had in mind. There are a bunch more. Anybody else got some? I know you do. It's okay. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Amen. All right. Let's see if we got one more. One more good verse that you know. Go ahead. Hold on. Go ahead, Dory. You were first. Anybody ever heard something like, man shall not live by bread alone? Mm, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so that was an example. We're going to do a lot of this. So now you know my expectation. So when you come on future Sundays when we do this, warmed up, on your toes, ready to participate, okay? This is going to be a very participatory uh, equipping time in there. Good. Nicely done. We've already mentioned that Psalm 119 is an expression of God's blessing, of the blessings of God's word in a writer's life. In many of your Bibles, the little subtitle the editors put in under the that is, from verse 105 that says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. We have a song that we all know that we'll probably sing before this sermon series is over that goes to that effect. The word of God in the psalmist's time was indeed a light. But like the physical lights that would have existed at the time of the psalmist, they would be more like an oil lamp or a candle. By comparison, we today, with the completed word of God, with the rest of the story that the psalmist didn't have, to us now, the word of God is like a dazzling headlamp. Literally and figuratively. Literally, because it's excellent now. What else? We don't have to take this little candle and walk around and try and see what's going on. We have this bright light. But we also know, because of all that the Word has taught in the Old and New Testament, that all of that Word of God transforms, renews our mind, right? It is a light into our feet through our brain, through our brain. That's why it's a headlamp. Crazy. Silly, I know. But that's what I did. We have, praise God, we now much more clearly see than our spiritual ancestors did because we got the rest of the story. So let's use our imagination to kind of grasp the significance of this difference between the oil lamp and the headlamp. And I'm going to use an example from our own American history of the Underground Railroad. So let's go back and imagine we're somewhere in the early to mid-1800s and imagine that we were doing just fine with our clan and our people in Africa and we got captured and snatched out of that, survived a pretty horrific trip to America and got sold at an auction to a slave owner with a plantation somewhere along the, what is today the South Carolina-Georgia border. It's a picture of a slave auction. And when you get to that said plantation, you happen to run into the fact that there are some slaves there with you who are from your part of Africa, and you guys share a language. And they tell you that there is this means to freedom called the Underground Railroad. And that if you can escape, and if you can get your way along this Underground Railroad to the north, you can get free. 
You can attain your freedom. Here's a general map of the routes to freedom, borrowed from the Smithsonian out there, and you can see my pin. Let's see if I can make the laser work. It's got a laser. There it is. So that's about maybe where you are on your plantation. These pathways that you see on this map, these are not the nice paved jogging paths that we have today. These are not roads or freeways. They couldn't be. They were extremely remote, extremely rough, full of obstacles, full of dangers, and they were made more dangerous because in those days, it was illegal to escape slavery And the laws of the day required anyone who came across an escaped slave to return them dead or alive to their master. They got more money if they, they returned the slave. So you couldn't even travel on these open, on these difficult, torturous, dangerous paths in daytime. You had to travel under the cover of darkness so nobody could see you because you stood out in certain parts of the country. You had to be way away from developed places and nice roads because you might run into other people. And you definitely couldn't travel on a nice moonlit night because everybody else was gonna travel on a nice moonlit night too. So you had to go on the darkest of dark nights, usually in the bad weather, along these really treacherous remote trails that weren't maintained, didn't have little trail markers and little lights like you have on your driveway telling you which way to go. If you had any light at all, it was usually like a little oil lamp or a little candle. So imagine, if you will, close your eyes and think about this dark, dark night in this very dangerous, treacherous path. And here you are with your one little candle trying to creep along the path, desperately afraid that you're going to snap a twig or you're going to raise the candle up too high for people to see you and that what you're going to fall into and what lies beyond what you can see. Certainly much better than no light. It was a lamp into your feet and a light into your path and grateful for it. But this is, this is what it was like to walk by the light that the psalmist had. Now you can imagine if you had to make that same journey and you had a modern technological headlamp like we have that always looks where your eyes go and you don't have to do anything to it and you can make it ultraviolet or infrared or you can make it light blue so nobody can see you. Um, See the difference on how much better your path to freedom, how much less difficult it would be to travel that path to freedom with a headlamp like that. That's what we enjoy today. The parallel I'm trying to draw is that much like Paul Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the Underground Railroad was to them like our progress to the heavenly city is, our progression from the slave sinners that we were to the perfected saints that we will be fully sanctified when the Lord returns. So that's the headlamp idea. Let's talk about why we love and hate psalms. Because you know it's true. We, in the fundamental branches of the evangelical church, can't really seem to get ourselves reconciled with psalms. On one hand, we love the psalms. We love them. They connect to our emotions and our humanness. They draw us closer to God. They inspire us to genuine heartfelt worship. On the other hand, we hate them because we fund these particularly those of us confident enough to put the word Bible in our name, have been teaching us uh, ourselves for many decades about the dangers of thinking with our emotions. We quickly invoke something like Jeremiah 17, 9 to say, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, who can understand it? As a caution against feeling-based thinking. It's an okay caution, it's reasonable which is usually very quickly followed up by some admonition like Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
study harder, stick more stuff in there, it's gonna be fine. Don't trust what you feel down here, go with what you know up there. All true biblical teaching. So we're stuck. We kind of have this, ah, oh, I really want what that's given me and I'm really afraid to be that emotional about it and what do I do? It's only usually, correct me if your experience is wrong, but it's only usually when our feelings overwhelm us, when our feelings overwhelm our thinking that we submit to the Psalms. Right? Isn't that true? When our feelings overcome our thinking, we submit to the Psalms. Now, my experience across the several fundy Bible churches I've been to across the world is that we attract a certain personality type. We are a certain personality type. In the language of Myers-Briggs, and you can't read all this, I know up there, but you can see the pattern. We have much more than our fair share of introverts who seek information through senses, vice intuition, think more than we feel, and are quicker to judge than we are to perceive. Now that label doesn't apply to everyone, for sure, but we seem to collect a very large disproportionate population of such people, and they tend, we, we, I'm one of them, we tend to shy away from expressions of emotion. It's hard, it's uncomfortable, at least it is for me. Now, I assume all of you have been up to the Smithsonian Museum in D.C., some of the Smithsonian Museums. I believe most of you have lived here long enough to have done that. Way back 100 years ago, I was in a Bible college class on hermeneutics, which is interpretation, and, and one of the textbooks there gave, I think, a good illustration to help understand the tension we feel. And we see it between when we're, like, camped out in the epistles in the New Testament and then when we're trying to wrestle around through psalms and some of the old poetry. And those authors liken the difference between, like the difference between visiting the National Air and Space Museum and then visiting, and then visiting the National Art Gallery. The New Testament epistles are like displays at the Air and Space Museum. They tend to be fact-based, they're logic, they're organized, they're essays, they're trying to organize your thinking and convince you and persuade you with information and facts and logic. The Old Testament poetry, however, is word art designed to evoke in you an emotional response. And if you take your thinking hat and you come and look at the beautiful picture of Napoleon, and you get lost in, gee, I wonder, I wonder how many brush strokes that is. I wonder how they made that white, that color. You're going to kind of miss the picture, aren't you? And that's what Hans does. So their admonition and their caution was, while you can find some good doctrinal points in Psalms, you should not go to Psalms, Christian, Bible student, with the idea that you're reading a a doctrinal essay like you go to the New Testament epistles. You are reading a God-inspired writing that's intended to evoke emotion in you. It is emotional writing. It's tended to stir your spirit emotionally. So don't bring your thinking hat to the art gallery. Bring your feeling hat to the art gallery, okay? You got the difference? You got the understanding? Does that help you understand maybe the dissonance and the discord that you sometimes feel when you struggle between these things? It helped me. All right, let's get a little bit more academic. And let's go, now that we have some of that broad, general, scattered background, let's do just a little bit more rigorous academic background like we would normally for any series or teaching text that we do. Some of you may remember uh, a while back I shared this little uh, not my work, somebody else's interpretive checklist that really helps kind of check off the things to consider when we're trying to build the context and the understanding of the text in there. So let's walk through it briefly for Psalm 119, okay? Go for that. So the first two you may have noticed I grouped together of who and when. That's a great question. It doesn't have an inscription on it. None of the ancient texts have an inscription like some of them say a psalm of David when something happened or something like that. Nothing like that for Psalm 119 as far back as any scholars have looked at old texts. But deciding who we think wrote it kind of also sets the time it was written. So they're kind of linked together and that's why I linked them. So let's first consider who it may have been written by. 
The most common view that you might find in your study notes, and you'll find a lot online, is that, like many of the Psalms, it was written by David. David, God used David mightily to write Psalms and wonderful things in there. Okay, um, but you could easily build and see uh, that it might have been one of these other authors in there. And the only tiny reason why the who, when might matter a little bit is that what constituted the Word of God at the time of their writing would have been slightly different depending on who was writing it. Not every bit of the Word of God was equally available to all of those writers like it is to us today. For instance, David probably would have only had just the Pentateuch and maybe a couple old books like Job, but he would not have had the writings of Isaiah, for example, nor would he have had the book of Ezra or Nehemiah. That would not have been available to him. Um, he couldn't include those accounts in his inspiration for a psalm, but Ezra or Nehemiah certainly could have. They would have had that as part of what motivated them and showed them to do in there. The later authors would have also maybe had a few more of the prophetic writings and some of the prophecies that occurred between the time of David and some of these later people. Because if you look at that timeline, that's several hundred years between David and all these other potential authors, right? Lots of things happened, lots of prophecies were made. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter because the sentiments it's expressed in Psalm 119 are general enough to be universally applicable to whatever word of God you happen to have with you at the time. The second question to consider in the who, when, is who is it written to? Who is this written to? It is a timeless text. It's applicable today as it was then, but it was clearly intended for a Jewish audience for whom statutes and commandments and testimonies were a familiar thing. So if you read through it, as we study through it, you'll see that the author, the psalmist, was writing to people who understood all these things, which makes sense, would have been the people of Israel. It was in the Hebrew uh, scriptures at the time of the New Testament. I hope you convinced yourselves in our earlier exercise that just because this is part of the Old Testament, it applies to us today. I hope you convinced yourself the New Testament echoes the sentiment of Psalm 119, right? That the value of the Word of God. If not, we'll go through that again. All right, what? It's an acrostic poem in Hebrew, not in English. In Hebrew, it's an acrostic poem. What's an acrostic poem? Well, I've written a little tiny example up here. It's where you use letters to guide you in what the first word or the first sound of a poem is so that it, it helps with memory. Here's a tiny little one I made up. A, B, C, D, right? Those are the acrostic parts. Amazing grace brings unfailing love, covering multiple sins, delivering many captives, right? They're a powerful tool. Your brain hangs on very naturally to that framework. It's a powerful, useful tool. Assuming you know your ABCs or some other thing that you can use as the framework, right? Well. The Hebrew people would have known their ABCs in Hebrew, so the author used their alphabet as the way to organize so that they could remember it easily. 22 groups of eight stanzas each, which comes up to a total of 176 verses. That's a lot to talk about a pretty simple concept, the blessings of the word of God. Where the psalm was written is not recorded, and it's not necessarily relevant. It was probably one of the places by where those people were, but we don't know, and it doesn't really matter because the geographic context doesn't inform. It doesn't have anything like when I was in this city and I went there, or when I was in this city and did that, which has something, but it's, it's, it's um, geography independent. So it's okay, we don't really need it so much for the interpretation. Why? Was it written? Obviously, the author, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, really wanted us all to grasp how significant it was to have a life informed and guided by the Word of God and the value and blessing of it. How did the psalm come to us? We don't know. It doesn't have a process written in it like some of the epistles do. I was so-and-so dictating to such-and-such. -such. I wrote a letter, right? Didn't It's not there. But it, by time Jesus' day rolled around, the Psalms were part of 
Hebrew canon already, and they were often quoted in the New Testament, as many of you already know. Okay, so our last exercise of the day. We're running a little behind. I'm trying to go fast, but hopefully you'll bear with me. Anybody know what that word says? Sing it out if you know what that word means. Say it. So you know that word. It's familiar. It's like your ABCs. You know that. I hope you know that word, right? Gospel um, in there. So before we start on our exercise, I have to do a quick survey. If God has made it very easy for you to remember Scripture, would you please raise your hand or stand up? Really easy. Like it's no problem for you to catalog lots of Scripture in there. Me either. Right? Really, for some reason, it just seems to be antithetical to the human brain. I don't know why. But we're going to do a little in-class exercise using this acrostic technique to show how helpful it is to memorize. Now, I'm cheating a little since I think a lot of you have already done this already and you know it pretty well. At least some of the outbound students have. I borrowed it from Dare to Share. Um, and other places that use the same acrostic. So if we turn this into our acrostic... Then we have some letters that we can attach words to to help us remember. So here we go. You ready? G is God. It's pretty easy, right? Gospel has to do with God. O is our. S is sins. P is paying. E is everyone. And L is life. It's almost the gospel message all by itself in haiku form. God, our sins, paying everyone life, right? You could almost get away with it right there. But let's amplify it for the benefit of the unbelieving hearers to know what that. So we had our six letters and a word that we knew. We used those six letters to remind us of six words. Some would call these the six words of eternal life. And now we have starter words for each of the stanzas. So let's use them to build across from there. Hopefully my technology will work. Excuse me while I look. All right. So here we go. Our six words of eternal life, let's build on them. The first word is God. In God's word, what does the first word in God's word say God does? Say it out loud. Come on, you guys can talk louder than that. He created. In the beginning, God created. Ah, okay, that's a good, uh, good, in the beginning, God created. We can use that same thing. Created what? Well, everything, duh. But the gospel doesn't necessarily really apply to everything. Who does the gospel apply to? Which of the things in God's creation is the gospel aimed at? Us. God created us. Good way to remember that, right? First thing is God. First thing God did is created. The special thing he created was us. That's what the gospel has to do with. Why did he create us? To be with him. Got that? G, God. God created us to be with him. All right, we got that? Let's do the second one, our. Give you a hint. Look at the third word. The hint's right there, right? Right after our, the hint of the next word coming is right underneath it, our sin. What could our sin have to do with the gospel? Why, how does our sin fit in with the gospel? It separates us from God. He created us to be with him, our sin separates it. That's a problem. We have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Third part of the problem, what can we do about those sins? Nothing. Our sins cannot be removed by good deeds. It's bad news. Sorry, friend, no matter what great thing you've done, you can't wash away that sins in the eyes of God. So Houston, we have a giant problem. We've, we've fouled up God's creation with our sins, and we can't do anything about it. But paying, when you pay, you pay what? You pay a price, right? What's the price? I'll pay you for that. So paying the price for, read the third word, for sin, who paid that price? Jesus. And he did it by dying and rose again. Paying the price for sin, it's even a rhyme. Jesus died and rose again. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Got it? All right. That's good news. Now we got more good news. Everyone. What could everyone have to do with that promise? Think John 3.16. 
Everyone who trusts or believes in him alone has what? Eternal life. Pretty easy, right? This acrostic thing works out good. It works out good. You guys can do it. What about that eternal life? When does it start? Life with Jesus begins as soon as you believe, right now, and lasts forever. Do you believe in the acrostic? Do you believe in the power of the acrostic? These will be posted online, Denise, if you want them. All right, you guys good? Believe in the acrostic? You got a tool you can use now. If you didn't know about that tool, now you have one. So let's review. This time you guys lead it. You ready? G. Say it one more time. God did what? Nice. O. Nice. S. By sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Excellent. P. Paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose again. E. Nice. L. That's right. Life with Jesus begins now and lasts forever. So, in the process of six minutes, you guys mastered that thing. Nice work. Now, I'm not sure that's totally fair because you probably had mastered it before, but I wanted to inspire you and be confident that you can do your homework because you just did it. You just did it right in front of us and with each other, okay? And we're going to have time in class to do our homework. I know you hate homework, but we're going to do some in class, and we're going to do it together, which makes it easier. Ms. Penterman approves of in-class homework done together. We are all, as a congregation, going to memorize all of Psalm 119. We are all going to do it together in class. You can do it. It's only eight verses per letter, one letter per week between sermons. That gives you two verses per day and two days of review. You got this. You can do this. I know you can do this. All right? So here's your homework assignment. Now, unfortunately, the acrostic of Psalms 118 is, again, in English, not in Hebrew, so you don't have that. But I think you can do it. Next Sunday, in preparation for our time next Sunday, memorize the first eight verses, the Hebrew letter Aleph, because we're going to talk about it. Now, I don't know about you. I'm a little old school. Index cards help me memorize things. So I have here in my possession packs of 100 index cards. If you divide 176 verses by two verses per card, how many cards will you use? 88 cards. I have packs of 100 in case you mess up. So they're also pretty cheap at Walmart. But today, if you're serious, if you sit there right now and say, I believe, Brett, I think I can do this, I'm going to do it, I'm going to ask you to make a public commitment and come up here and get a deck of cards as your testimony for how faithfully and how serious you are about memorizing this. So I only got 10. I'll bring more next week. So come on up. I'm I'm serious. If you're going to do this thing and you want to use cards, you can come up and get them. But if you are digitally inclined, and it's okay if you are, if you're digitally inclined, the app Quizlet is available that can help you do this online if you don't like to carry around a big deck of index cards. But you can come get them later. If the spiritual value of doing this isn't enough for you, I hope it is, but if it isn't, I have a secular endowment. When we get done with this whole thing, if you come up here and you stand in front of your brothers and sisters and you recite from memory all 176 verses with not many errors, mostly correctly, you will receive, if you're the driver of a car, the very best headlight bulbs AutoZone sells for your car. We'll take care of that for you. So you have the best lights in your car. Not new light fixtures, just the bulbs. Don't get too fancy on me now. 
If you're a non-driver, then you will get either a very top of the line nice headlamp, hiking type headlamp, not a minor type headlamp, or a super nice defeat your enemy's flashlight out of the whole thing. Okay? So that is your incentive system beyond the spiritual incentive of doing the thing. It's our last slide. So coming it all back together, let us rebuild what's broken here the exact same way that God used Ezra and Nehemiah to do. Let's rebuild it on the Word of God. Let's start by putting it in our heart using index cards and Quizlet apps and each other. Let's memorize all of Psalm 119, 176 verses to remind us of the personal blessings of standing on the Word of God. Let's pray. God in heaven, you're amazing. You've been amazing today, and Lord, forgive me if I have diluted or diminished or distracted your people away from what you're doing here in this place. But God, I pray that you use all of it, use all of it to transform us, that your spirit would stir us like we read in Ezra and Nehemiah, and that you would rebuild us from the inside out using your word and your spirit as we have seen so many times in scripture. Lord, we commit to start today. We want this to have its healing and transformative effect in us. We submit to you and we ask you through your Holy Spirit and through your brothers and sisters to help us put this in our hearts, that it might be a blessing to us that has been to so many saints who walked before us. We ask it in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.
uh, ask that everyone join us for potluck uh, and, and have some good fellowship. I'm dismissed.